When I hear the Gibson name, it gives me many different emotions. And it goes from heritage and legacy and a history that is so incredibly rich, but also innovation and a drive for the future. Orville Gibson is the father of Gibson. He was a luthier. He lived in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where he had his workshop and where the company was incorporated. And that is where we came from. To my right, we have the first mandolin that Orville ever made in 1894 and the last one that he ever made in 1906. Look at the progress of where he started and where he ended with his mandolin. The craftsmanship that goes into it, the beautification of the instrument, the inlay work, all this was done by hand, by him, in his workshop. That's why we have instruments that have binding, that have inlays, that have beautification on the peg heads, that have a carved top. That's how we make guitars today. Binding is used on guitars on acoustics or semi-hollow, uh, like in the case of the ESs. Its initial reason is to dress off the rim and top or back to add a feature to hide that seam. And it all, you can say it kind of adds as like a, a bumper, but on a solid body, it's, it's mostly aesthetic, you know? So in the case of a Les Paul, you don't really have to have it on there, but for the iconic Les Paul standard, you expect binding on it. Gibson's always used the rope method ever since we were binding guitars. It's where we use a, a canvas rope and after we apply the glue to the binding, we wrap it around the guitar, hold it down at the waist, and then start that wrapping process. With the wrapping for the binding, there is a pattern and you have to get that down and everybody does the same pattern. It's the same sequence of wraps and we don't really bear off that too much. We go counterclockwise, making sure there are no gaps and applying different pressure to different areas of the body. It has to be in a specific sequence around the perimeter of the body, inside the waist, inside the cutaway, on the tip of the horn. Those are all critical areas that you have to have the proper tension to ensure that you have no gap or maybe a fail down the line. So it's very, very critical. The binders spend at least two months learning that trade before they can you know, go solo and start binding. At first, it's overwhelming and it looks like a messy spiderweb array of rope wrapped around the perimeter of the guitar. But if you compare, they're always gonna be in the same sequence. And that was just handed down from binder to binder. Uh, most of my time I spent binding guitars in a body line. I don't think there's been a lot of change as far as the process. I mean, we pretty much you know, still do a lot of stuff the way we do them, just like, a, like I said, binding, I mean, everybody thinks they're going to try to come in there and change that and it's been that way for years and it's I don't think they'll ever change it but I think it's a you know just one of the things that makes it guitar different from everybody else. The glue that we use for the binding is basically the binding itself ground up into a powder and then we mix it with acetone and solvents like that that melt that plastic and turn it into the adhesive holding the binding to the guitar itself. The solvents will then eat into the binding so when we put all that pressure from the rope that binding will then melt into that edge surface of the body that it's being glued to. That's where we can get a nice clean seam. After the binders finish binding the guitar, they'll indicate when they finish it, then they know how long to let it dry. We have a system, a single piece flow, where it goes up on a rack, and once we fill up those 20 spaces, we start over again. And by the time we start over, it's dry. It's ready to unwrap and we can send it down. The average binder will, will typically average 50 guitars per day, which is just incredible. After the guitars are bound and unwrapped, they then have to be rim sanded. And that's basically a belt sander with a table that the guitar sits on and it's rotated around that belt sander to sand that binding flush with the rim of the body. In the case of guitars that don't have binding, we'll still generally rim sand them just to remove any cutter marks uh, from the machining process. After the rim sanding, 
Guitars then go to the slack belt sander. In the case of a Les Paul, where you have a contoured maple top and a flat back, the guitar will sit in a fixture on a table that slides under a big belt sander. And it's so large that, you know, it's kind of slack in the center. The operator will move that body under that sanding belt. And if he's doing the back, he has a, a wood form with felt and a handle that he'll slide over that back, pressing that belt on it to sand the back flat. And when he sands the top, he'll wad up a rag into a ball, and then he'll press the bottom side of that rag into the sanding belt, which conforms into the contour of the maple top. I am in the factories every other day, and I watch all of our craftsmen, our artisans, our people here being so proud of what they're doing. And we celebrate craftsmanship. We are a modern day USA made and US centric manufacturing business. And that is the legacy that Orville left us.